I think that most people know how to build muscle and be physically strong, right? We know the difference between what, what's good for us, what's bad for us, right? It pretty much boils down to eating the right foods and exercising, right? Like, we're aware that if we were to go to Whataburger every day for every meal while also spending every day on the couch watching YouTube or Netflix, we wouldn't be surprised if we weren't the pinnacle of fitness the next morning, right? And you wouldn't be surprised because you understand what it takes to become physically strong, what it takes to be fit, to have fitness, right? We, we know that it takes a lot of effort. It takes actual stress on your body. And over time, as well as regular maintenance, physical strength and endurance grow, right? But I think what a lot of us don't understand as much is how do we get spiritually strong? How do we build spiritual muscle? Just like we would go to a gym and, you know, add on a little more weight this week and maybe a little more in a few more weeks, you know, how do we gain that, that endurance and, and be able to build that strength in our faith? I think that it boils down to both physically and spiritually, you know, we, we all want to grow, but nobody wants to be tested. We don't want to endure what is going to come our way in order to make that difference. No one wants to undergo suffering or physical stress, right? And instead, we prefer to go through our lives comfortably. You know, we want the path of least resistance. We know that that resistance is the key to our growth, but we still might avoid it. Think about how easy it is to, to go through that, that path of least resistance in our lives, right? Like, if we need the answer to something, we just take out our phone, you know, ask Siri, right? You know, we, not go to a library. I mean, oh my gosh, how difficult it is to, like, get on a computer and go and search and look something up, right? Or, you know, if you want the world to know what's going on in your life, anyone to know what's going on in your life, you can post it on Instagram or Snapchat or just get in a group text message and send it to people because, man, writing letters and printing off pictures, that's so last century, right? Or like, I, I, I want to eat something, and so, you know, I throw a, a pizza in the oven from the freezer or go to a drive through of, you know, your favorite fast food restaurant because... Who has the time to raise enough cows to have cheese and meat and harvest wheat and tomatoes for every single meal, you know? But what about when it comes to our relationship with God, us wanting to be closer with God? Because we might go through those, those little steps. We might show up at church, sing a song every now and again. We, we might say a prayer before a meal, right? But are we actually walking away with a deeper relationship with the Lord that is growing and, and strengthening and gaining endurance. Without actually putting any time in on our own, it's really hard to do. I would say impossible. When things get hard in our lives, we tend to turn to other things to cope, to make things easier. Again, that path of least resistance instead of investing more time with the Lord in Scripture and in prayer. In a lot of ways, our lives don't really have much resistance at all, and so when we hit any level of resistance at all, it all seems like it's falling apart. It's so terrible, and I'm, I'm hating to burst anybody's little bubble in here, but I'm, I'm going to. I mean, being a Christian, being a follower of Jesus is a lot harder than just showing up on a Wednesday or a Sunday or both and maybe bowing your head at a dinner table. It is hard. We are going to face resistance, trials, temptation. And if we aren't working out those spiritual muscles and gaining that endurance, even at our absolute strongest, we are not able to carry the burdens of what life throws at us. We cannot endure the crushing weight of sin. It's too heavy. That's why tonight we're going to be in this new series talking about spiritually strong, right? We're going to be looking in Matthew 3, verse 16, if you want to join me there tonight. We're actually going to, to start in, in Matthew 3, verse 16, and I want you to have a, a, your Bible physically open. If you don't have one, grab a, a pew Bible, because I want us to see what this looks like in context here. So we're starting in Matthew 3, 16, but we're primarily going to be looking at chapter 4 here, and I want us to see how this 
flow. So grab a pew Bible, grab your own Bible, open it up and, and follow along with us here. So like I said, we're going to be looking primarily at chapter 4 here. I want us to look at the spiritual strength that Jesus shows here as he endures this heavy, crushing weight of temptation. But like I said, we're going to start here in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. We're going to read through chapter 4, verse 11, so that we also can recognize this oppressive weight of sin and the spiritual temptation that you and I also carry that can only be overcome by a relationship with God. Let's look at this together, starting in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And we jump over to chapter 4, and this is what happens right after that. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, on the roof, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. They'll catch you. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God. And him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him. And behold, the angels came and were ministering to him. I think that we can really easily look at this passage that we just read and and, and we witness the strength of Jesus. I mean, that's very clear from what we just read. He literally just like speaks a few words. He commands the devil to back off and it happens. But I think that it's harder for you and I to look at this passage, maybe, and and to recognize how do we fit into it. Like, yeah, the power of God is so mighty, it can move mountains, right? But I could never do what Jesus did there. I I don't have that kind of strength. Like, think about it. If somebody came to you and they said, hey, I'm offering you to be king or queen of the entire world. Every kingdom, every nation on the entire earth in the palm of your hand, you will rule all of it. You know, you might have some, like, maybe some ideas of, like, okay, I actually might be able to make the world better here, but you're thinking about it. It's not something that you are immediately just throwing out of your mind based on who might be offering it. We can very easily fall into that place of temptation, be a very hard offer for any of us to reject. We would probably at least have to consider it for a second, right? Right? My guess is that after your baptism, too, God didn't necessarily drive you out into, like, a barren wilderness to have you, like, straight up battle Satan. Like, my guess is that that's probably not how it went for you. But we do need to recognize that when we do come to know God, when we recognize who Jesus is, what he did for us, who God made us to be, that something that we do declare through baptism, but even before that, when we just have this relationship with, with God... The enemy doesn't wait for you to get stronger in your faith to have him start tempting you. He doesn't wait a few years and say, like, "Mm, I'll, I'll, I'll let their faith build up a little bit before I start throwing weights on the bar, right? That's not the way that goes. Even we see in in this story, this is why we're reading this section of of chapter 3. It's immediately after Jesus has his baptism that he is 
sent out into the wilderness. We immediately enter into spiritual warfare against the powers of sin and darkness when we decide to make this relationship real with Jesus. Even if you don't consider yourself a Christian, though, I I need you to recognize that temptation is a universal human experience. doesn't matter who we are. We experience temptation. At some level, we all feel that push maybe sometimes to do that thing that we shouldn't do. Or if you're a Christian, maybe on the flip side, the things that God has commanded you to do that you know that you don't do, that's also a temptation. We all feel that at some level sometimes. And if you don't feel that, I mean, recognize something that that Miss Kathy just read for us in 1 Corinthians verse 12. We, We see that if you think that you're standing firm in the face of temptation, you are at risk of falling. If you think you're safe, you're one of the people that is most prone to fall down. You can't win against temptation. This is why we're looking at the story of Jesus and why it's so important for us Because Jesus fought and won. He is the perfect example of how we overcome this temptation, how we grow spiritually here. The thing that Jesus used to to win against temptation as he speaks with Satan here, we can learn how to use that in our fight against the enemy as well. The first thing we need to recognize is is in verse 1 of chapter 4. This temptation isn't happening without God's awareness. Not without God's approval. No, we read that it is the Holy Spirit. It's it's God himself that leads Jesus into the place where he is tempted. Now, I want to be clear. God is not tempting Jesus. But he does allow Jesus to be tested. Tempted, tested. Very similar words. They're a little different. For God, I mean, testing, it's not to see whether or not we're, we're going to pass or fail. God doesn't score us like that. Instead, God is testing us to make us stronger, to build that muscle, that endurance. You know, if you're, if you're physically training, if you've ever, you know, worked out and, and tried to build muscle or you're training for, you know, a marathon or something like that, you, over time, add a little bit more weight and a little bit more weight or you run that extra half mile and then add another half mile. You have to apply greater and greater stress to your muscles to adapt and to grow. And likewise, through spiritual strengthening, God allows you to go through these things that, yes, are hard, stressful, even considered suffering to help you grow spiritually. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 13 here. We read this just a a few moments ago. It says that no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. When we look at this passage, it might seem a little familiar. It gets taken out of context all the time. Probably this middle part there, you probably recognize that God's not going to tempt you beyond your ability. God's not going to give you more than you can handle, right? You know, God knows my limits, and so he's not going to load too many weights onto the bar, right? He's going to keep my burden light and easy. No, we're, we're going to be loaded down. Like, we are going to be tested and tempted, and we can absolutely fail and crumple under that weight, but it's only by God's strength. It's only by him that we can have the endurance to do it, to make it through. Not by our own ability, it's by God's strength that he provides a way for us to endure. We see this play out in in verse 3 in this story where we're reading this tempting of, of Jesus in Matthew. We see the enemy tempt Jesus with the very thing that he is weak for first, food. Jesus has been out in the wilderness. He hasn't eaten. And he tempts Jesus probably just how he would tempt us. The enemy tries to go after us in our weakness. 
Because it's so much easier for him to, to get us while we are weak. Under those circumstances, we're a lot more vulnerable, right? The devil doesn't fight. It's fair. The enemy has no problem taking advantage of you while you are weak. He doesn't wait for you to get a little breather before he starts throwing the punches. Jesus was physically weak. He hadn't eaten. And he still displays this great spiritual strength. It says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Like, boom, mic drop, right? Like, Jesus is essentially saying, like, yeah, I'm, I'm hungry. Food gives me physical energy. Yeah, I, I need that for my body to survive. Yeah, but what's most important is for my soul to be nourished. And I know where that nourishment is from, and it sure isn't from you, Satan. Like, I, I might physically die, my body might wither away, but I know where my security is, and my body might die right here and now, but my, I will live on forever with my Father. Jesus knows this truth, and he doesn't give in. In fact, you might think Jesus is like really quick to answer here and to, to say this response, and it's kind of like the perfect response, right? You might think Jesus is just you know, really good with words, but he's quoting the Old Testament here. Like he's, he's literally just taking this scripture, and, and he's able to take the scripture that he already knows in his heart, not reading off a scroll or something, and he's able to relate God's truth to his present situation. He's able to do this because he has it memorized. It's always with him and imprinted on his heart. And so he's able to take this truth of God and put it in his situation that he is in. And so the enemy decides to try a new tactic because this doesn't seem to work. He knows that Jesus, yeah, he has scripture memorized. And so he uses God's word against him. He tries to twist the Bible, God's truth, and apply it to this next temptation. Have you ever had somebody who, you know, takes words that you say out of context, twists them around, makes it say something that you really didn't? That's essentially what Satan is doing with God's word, with the Bible, with scripture. He's taking this scripture from Psalm 91, where, where God is speaking about a protection of his people. We need to recognize that, that even this, even scripture, even God's truth can be weaponized against us. The enemy will use a wide range of tactics in his efforts to crush you, even scripture, even the Bible, even spiritual leaders in your life. You know, with, with food, Jesus might have been tempted in his weakness, but at the same time, we see here that Jesus has tested where his strengths are, his trust in God. Yes, Satan is going to tempt you when you're weak and, and, and at those weak spots in your life. But really, truly, the greater danger is that place where Satan tempts us where we're strong. You know, we're aware of our weaknesses, and we actually probably put up some good defenses in those places where we're weak, right? But where we think we're strong, we leave ourselves super vulnerable to the enemy. You know, if, if you're prone to maybe, let's say, looking at things on your phone that you shouldn't, have an app that you have downloaded that you shouldn't or, or that you have blocked or something like that, like, you know that there's ways that you can protect yourself against that. If you have it blocked already, you know you can go into, like, settings on your phone and have, you know, somebody put in a password, have a, a friend or a, a leader or somebody in your life who can, um, who can come alongside you and keep you accountable for those things. You can put software on your phone in order to monitor those things. I mean... When you're aware of your weaknesses, you can do things, put safeguards in place to protect yourself from it. But when it comes to those places of strength, we really don't protect ourselves. We leave ourselves open to attacks by the enemy, right? Like we might have some kind of skill somewhere in your life, whatever it is. Think of something that you're good at, whatever that may be. Maybe you're good at painting or fixing cars or, you know, fixing some pipes or, you know, whatever it may be. You, you name it, whatever you're good at. You can very easily have pride that makes you think that that, that skill and ability is your own, something we were talking about last month. Now, Jesus is here, in, in this case, he's on top of a roof, and Satan is telling him, hey, throw yourself off because the angel's will save you and protect you. And, and now maybe we don't go to that kind of extreme to test God. But that's really what we're doing when we are 
leaving ourselves open to attack, when we have this, this pride or whatever it is that keeps us vulnerable in our strengths. And I think that, quite frankly, it's probably even worse in, in those of us who we, we believe that we follow Jesus. When we believe in Jesus, we can do some really foolish things to test God, and we can just claim that it's our faith, right? We can date or be in relationships with people that don't know Jesus, that doesn't share those same values with us. And we can just, you know, pray, okay, God's going to, to turn them, him or her, into a Christian. And so I'll just keep on praying that. God's going to change them, and, and I'll just hold on to that hope. We spend all night on our phones instead of studying, doing whatever, and then like two minutes before the exam, you sit down and pray like the craziest prayer that you've ever prayed, right? Or you choose your school or career path or, or what you want to do in your life, and you choose that thing, and you say, okay, God, you come alongside me and my choice and what I've chosen, what I want to do, and you make it work all out in my favor because I've already chosen what I want to do. I'm sure you can think of something for yourself. In all of these situations, we need to recognize that testing God is not trusting God. When we test God, we try to force him to do our will and what we want. That's what testing God is. But when we trust God, we're surrendering to his will and his way and his wants for our life. Now, I think we can very easily fall into this trap of thinking, maybe not directly, but that we can manipulate God for, to, to make him do what we want him to do. But God is not our personal genie. He doesn't grant wishes. We should not be asking God, hey, I want all of these things in my life, the things that I want. We should be conforming to what God wants in our life not the other way around. That would be testing God. But Jesus understood the difference between trusting and testing, and he replies to Satan with yet another scripture, knowing not to put God to the test. But I think that the, the third temptation that Jesus endures here in verse 8 is probably the trickiest one, probably the one that you and I encounter the most. This is where the enemy tempts Jesus to try and take a shortcut. You know, totally apart from this that we are reading here in Matthew, Jesus' purpose here on earth, what he was here to do, it was to defeat the enemy. It was also to restore this relationship between God and humanity for the kingdom of God to be on earth, right? Jesus came to, to have the kingdom of God be present on earth, and when Jesus was to die, he would return back to heaven and he would reign over heaven and earth with God again, right? Jesus' kingship, it was already guaranteed. But the thing is, is probably just a couple years down the road, he was also going to experience tons of abuse and even death at the hands of people who called themselves followers of God. Satan was offering him a shortcut. Verse 9, he's, he's saying like, hey, Jesus, if you just worship me, if you bow down to me, just do this one thing. Just do it here for just a moment. I'll give you what you came for right now. Without all that suffering, without all that sacrifice, and I can give you all of these earthly kingdoms. I can give you exactly what you came for. Satan is trying to get Jesus to pursue this right thing. I mean, this is what Jesus is there for. And we know, like, if Jesus were to take control of all of these kingdoms, he would do right by those people. Jesus is good. He would, he would do right by these nations, by the, these kingdoms that he is over. But the way that he would acquire it would be all the wrong way. Jesus doesn't abandon his devotion to the Father in order to get what he wants for a moment. Jesus doesn't compromise what is most important for what is most immediate. The temptation to trade what's important for what is immediate is something that I think you and I face every day. We want to take shortcuts. We want that easy way. Whatever that easiest way to cope, to deal with our life, to get to the ends that, that we want, we'll do it. The thing is, is if you have to abandon God 
to get something. It's not worth getting. If you have to put your faith to the side for a minute or just press pause, even if just for a moment, just, just a moment to gain something else, to get something else that you want, it's not worth it. And so Jesus replies to the devil's invitation to this shortcut, yet again by quoting scripture, but also pr- pretty angrily. I mean, there's, there's an exclamation point here. I mean, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Jesus isn't willing to lose sight of his goal, of this devotion to the Lord for one second. He doesn't allow the temptation of having everything he ever wanted to distract him at all. Even this thing that that God had put him there to do, to be over the nations of the world, I mean, this is what he could, he could have it right there. But he doesn't discount that devotion to God for a second. There's no shortcuts in our relationship with God. He is the only one worthy of our devotion and worship. Following Jesus isn't easy. If we follow him, we are inevitably going to be tested by God. We are going to encounter fierce temptation by the enemy. Like I said, it doesn't matter whether you believe in God or not. You are encountering temptation. You have encountered temptation and you will continue to encounter temptation. You are being pushed towards sin by the enemy. Trying to get you to make just little allowances in your life here and there. Like receiving just a little bit of comfort in that moment of weakness. Making little excuses for yourself. Being tempted in in the midst of sin it's twisting the truth just a little bit in those places where you thought you were strong to get you to falter or even the temptation to take those shortcuts to make those allowances in our sin to, to lower our standards and to embrace just some of the little sin in our life and that feels safe because we reject the big sin in our life but is any level of sin worth it Should we be okay with our sin and just accept it and, you know, just brush it off? Because it's just something that happens, something we can't avoid. Is our sin even significant enough for God to even care about it? My sin is so small, it just doesn't even matter, right? A little later in, in Matthew, Jesus puts it really plainly. He says in Matthew 16, 26, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? If we submit to our sin and just allow it to continue, just embrace the sin, our spiritual life will be crushed by the oppressive weight of sin, like that that bar that, that we've been loading weights onto, it will crush you. You will not be able to lift it. We might try to take the, the easy life and the shortcuts in our life to try and avoid getting more and more weights on, but it's just going to end up leading to more shortcuts, which is just going to lead us to fall into more weakness, which we're just going to end up having those places of strength turn into places of weakness, and then we're going to fall into selfishness and emptiness, and we will just be crushed by that weight of sin. But if we begin regularly exercising our, our spiritual strength, just like Jesus, we can have that strength to overcome. Think of what Jesus says. I mean, he, he just declares it right out loud, like, get out of here, Satan. Get out. Get away from me. And what happens in verse 11? It says, the devil left him, and the angels came and were ministering to him. We call out in Jesus' name, devil, get away from me, and he flees, and Jesus is near to us. We have even better than this, we have the Holy Spirit that resides with us. This is the promise of God being played out in front of us. I mean, we we are not left alone in our testing and our temptation. We are called to do just as as Jesus did. I mean, spending enough time in our scripture that that it is imprinted on our hearts, that goes with us wherever we go, that we're able to take that that experience that we're having and, and mesh it with God's truth in every moment knowing that we can't do it alone, that we we need to rely on God's strength because 
we don't have that strength to submit to God's authority, to not make ourselves the authority. If we're willing to, to do that, we can slowly and steadily continue to build this spiritual strength and endurance to allow us to be able to overcome larger and larger temptations as more and more weights are put onto the bar. To not be completely overwhelmed by that temptation and, and testing, but to allow it to continue to grow us. Now, I recognize that in this room, we are in very different stages in our walk with Jesus. You know, some of you have followed Jesus for years. You know, you've been coming to this church for a very long time. Some of you maybe have just known Jesus for a couple of years, maybe even just a few months. But my encouragement to you is that you allow yourself to continue to be tested. That when those moments of testing do come your way, when those moments of, of stress and, yes, even suffering do come your way, you don't run away from that test, but that you run towards the Lord, making sure that you are working out your salvation alongside him. Spending time in your scripture, allowing his word to be written on your heart, praying fervently, listening to the godly wisdom of the mentors you have around you in your life. And when you feel like that temptation maybe is too much to bear, to remind yourself that the Lord's strength and Holy Spirit is with you as you endure. It is not by your own hand and your own capability that you are trying to lift that bar. And I know that some of you in this room, you, you don't have a relationship with Jesus. You don't know Jesus at all. Maybe some of you have been going to church for years, maybe your entire life, but you know, you, know, you know the answers, you know the sermons, you know the stories, but you still turn to your temptation, bowing down to it, submitting to that temptation instead of submitting to the Lord and his ways in your life. You need to recognize that there is an enemy against you trying to get that sin to be your normal, to push out of your mind that God loves you, that Jesus came to save you. Even if you were at your lowest point, recognize that just like God used his spirit to lead Jesus into that desert for testing, God uses even the darkest moments of our life to reveal his light. Just call to mind how important he is in your life. God is going to test us fiercely, but it is also by his strength alone that we endure it. The spiritual strength that, that we're talking about, like, it, it isn't our own. This isn't our spiritual strength that we're talking about. It is the strength of God that goes with us. It's the strength of Christ that is with us in the midst of that testing and that temptation always. So recognize the challenge that is before you. Because we are going to stumble. We are going to fall. It is going to happen. But this all contributes to the endurance, to the perseverance, the stress, and yes, the suffering that you will encounter in your life for the sake of Jesus but it's ultimately going to lead you into a deeper relationship with him. A life in Christ, it's never easy, but the strength within our God that allows us to endure through all life's tests, trials, and temptations is unmatched by any other.